Welcome to the Delicious Legacy Podcast, an archaeogastronomical adventure through space and time. I'm Tom Dinas, and today I'll guide you to another delightful and fascinating exploration of humankind's history of food, together with my two exciting and very knowledgeable guests. Do you feel some people that you just met in some other circumstances if we didn't live across the ocean in different continents, could have been your soulmates. In another occasion, we would have been colleagues, perhaps cook together or collaborate for many years. They are lovers of food and history, and of course, food history. Hosts of the historical supper club under the name Edible History in New York, Victoria and Jay, Jay Raphael and Victoria Flexner are now also the authors of an exciting new book. Their incredible book, called The History of the World in 10 Dinners, is released on September 19th by Rizzoli Books. And I had the pleasure to read it in advance and I can confirm it's a spectacular book for all, with a plethora of great recipes from a wide range of ancient and historical sources, all recreated in painstaking detail for the reader with an attention to historical detail thanks to Victoria, full of fascinating facts that bring context and life to the dishes. I interviewed the pair in advance of the release of their book to talk about it and find out more about their work, efforts and ethos behind it. Now, join me in my exclusive chat for your ears and only. Their book, A History of the World in 10 Dinners, by Resolve Publications, is out on the 19th of September and there is a book tour in New York with dates in September 20th at Arkestratos in Brooklyn, 6 p.m., September 26th at Rizzoli Bookstore at 6 p.m., and Wednesday, October the 11th in Barnes & Noble in Brooklyn at 6.30. And now let's go to our conversation. Victoria and Jay, Jay and Victoria, welcome to the Delicious Legacy Podcast. So happy to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Excellent. So if um, you would like to tell some something about yourselves before we go in about your book. So let's um, talk a little bit about you. So let's start with Victoria. Sure. Um, I am a food historian based here in New York City. And in 2014, I founded the Supper Club Edible History, which is based here in New York. And for a number of years, we did historical pop-up dinners around the city. Jay is the executive chef of Edible History. And in 2021, um, we began writing this book, A History of the World in 10 Dinners. Great. Fantastic. And Jay? Hi, my name is Jay Rifle. Um, I'm the executive chef of Edible History. I have a background in like fairly hardcore fine dining, but I'm also very much like a history nerd um, and a nerd in many other ways. And when Victoria and I met, it was just the perfect synergy of what we wanted to do. We had seen all the same stuff. We had read all the same stuff. So it was just a perfect like moment. <laughs> Fantastic. I think it, it sounds like a, a bit like my start on the uh, food and history world, you know. Um, I think around 2013, I was started doing some pop-ups, 2014, oh, nice. uh, with, uh, f- with um, historical food, basically. Yeah. With a couple of friends. And then, yeah, from that progressed and changed and... Um, apart from the pop-ups, which obviously before the pandemic were more regular, and I have stopped now and started a podcast during the pandemic. Like I'm in the same kind of uh, mindset, you know, I love history and I love food and I love anything to do with those two things and bring them together, this synergy, as you said, mm-hmm. Jay. So I think we have uh, much more in common than I initially thought. Oh, marvelous. Yeah, we, have, we, had, our, we had our pre-pandemic <laughs> food history lives and our pandemic pivots into other mediums, perhaps. Yeah, the pandemic was almost a blessing in disguise, I think, for both of us because it allowed us to really like focus on the book which was a tremendous amount of work and it was endlessly fun. So it worked out kind of well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. One silver lining. Great. And um, did you 
Yeah, how do the pop-ups work? Can you describe a little bit about your pop-ups? Yeah, well, Jay and I built up um, quite a, I guess, like a community or sort of following here in the city. Uh, we did, mainly we were doing dinners in Brooklyn. And um, it was quite a diverse crowd. It, but, you know, the uniting factor was people who were interested in food and or history. Um, and they were you know, on urban farms and pottery studios and restaurants and kind of warehouses in Bushwick. And Jay and I would pick a menu um, from a specific time period. So perhaps Tudor England. And Jay would get all of the, you know, the, the recipes from period manuscripts from Tudor England. And, um, you know, we usually host around 40 people at a dinner. And as each dish came out, they were quite like large, elaborate, theatrical meals. I would tell all of our guests about each dish and how it relates to sort of the broader um, kind of historical period. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were they were really fun. Yeah, we always joked <laughs> that we were doing food as the gateway drug to history. People would come to eat the food. They'd be, you know, they'd think they know some of the history. And then Victoria would really open up the history and connect the history to the food, to the people. And there is this moment when people are eating food and you can kind of see it where they're realizing, oh, there is a connection to a whole other time and place. It was, it was a really marvelous experience. Mm, yeah, yeah, but I bet it was difficult to cook all that stuff um, for 40 people, especially. Well, I mean, you know, honestly, I've been a professional chef for a long time. So, and I, and I didn't do it solo. I always had, you know, friends and assistants, uh, and, you know, and it was mm. a couple of days of prep always, but yeah. some of the more fun stuff was the very elaborate, you know, the whole animals sewed together and standing up and, you know, things on fire and that sort of stuff, but <laughs> it's always fun. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so obviously this all culminated on uh, you two getting um, this book, writing this book, which is um, called, if you want to tell me. It's A History of the World in 10 Dinners. Fantastic. Exactly. And this is released on? Uh, September 19th, next uh, Tuesday. Out for pre-sale on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. <laughs> yeah. So many books for exactly. Wherever books are sold. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um so when when I when we first communicated and I got the email and I thought oh, okay there's gonna be great a book about um, that uh, stuff and then history and dinners blah blah I kind of thought it would be far simpler to be honest like I thought maybe it's gonna be three <laughs> recipes from each period okay fine but <laughs> when I actually read it <laughs> uh, I just been blown away but the, the detail on it is uh, marvelous and uh, there's so many different dishes for each um, each time period would you like to tell us a little bit about um, some specific periods um, so how, first how did you thought on creating this chapters each chapter and uh, the, the the recipes on each chapter so if we start with with victoria about the history of that and then if we go to jay about how do you choose the recipes absolutely um well the two sort of go hand in hand in a sense but i'll let jay talk more about his process of selecting the recipes we decided that we didn't want to cover a time period that there weren't adequate kind of recipe sources from. We wanted to be able to paint a really full picture of a time period in the place and the types of, um, you know, foods that were consumed and beverages that were consumed. And while we have, you know, there are recipes for beer and bread from ancient Sumeria, it's that's not quite enough to do what Jay and I were sort of looking to do, which really is to create these sort of snapshots of different periods of history. So with those um, kind of self-imposed restrictions in place, Jay and I ultimately selected um, ancient Rome, 10th century Baghdad, the medieval Silk Road, Renaissance Italy, Tudor England, Al-Andalus Spain, which is Muslim-ruled Spain, 
the great circulation, which is a term that we use for uh, what is traditionally referred to as the Columbian Exchange, but perhaps people are also familiar with the the term the age of exploration, although in the book we kind of uh, explain why that's not a term um, we want to use anymore. Mm, absolutely, <laughs> um, yeah. And we also cover the Ethiopian Empire, Versailles, and then the entire book ends in 19th century New York with the birth of the restaurant, which is kind of a nice full circle moment. Mm, brilliant. So, yeah, as Victoria said, like often the biggest limiting factor is just what actual texts exist. I mean, there are, you know, we work from actual t cookbooks. So, you know, there's certain things and also what's in translation because I only speak so many languages but for each chapter it's important to think of it as you know it's the history of the world in 10 dinners so it's very important for each series of recipes to be an actual dinner to have a beginning a middle and an end and to have some parallel to what we think of as a dinner like i would normally group the sweeter dishes at the end even though dessert was not historically a thing and certainly in the ethiopian empire Dessert's not really a thing, so that's the only chapter without desserts. We do try to move from small to large, and we try to create a menu between Victoria and I that reinforces the story that we're trying to tell about the period. So that's incredibly interesting. Mm. So often dishes are chosen because a ingredient might be incredibly important to that time period, or that a certain cooking technique is incredibly emblematic of that period, or certainly demonstrates like the sophistication of the period, which is something that was incredibly important for us to communicate that a lot of these times, even though they were very far in the past, you know, these are very, very sophisticated people with art and culture and cuisine. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's a very important point, you know, that um, in every period, in every period of human history, people were sophisticated and clever and equally yeah. uh, as us, basically. We're, we're yeah. not better than <laughs> our ancestors. Yeah. There is a caveat also, and I, I was actually thinking of it because of your own uh, ancient Greek food uh episode is again the records that we have and the foods that we're discussing are the foods mostly of the elites and often the further back we go the more that is true just because we don't have a whole lot of records of what you know poorer people were able to mm. eat there's a you know much much less meat and generally there's just a lot more grains and pulses for most humans throughout much of history but it doesn't make a really exciting cookbook Yes, and also, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't have surviving records for, for, of the common Precise. people so much. Uh, even if even if they ate a lot of other stuff, we don't know exactly how they ate them, but we can only assume as much as we can and create some some stuff from archaeological yes. finds as well. Exactly, that's all we can do. And uh, did you manage to find something that you want to mention from um, less uh, privileged backgrounds? But let's say perhaps. The, are there some recipes in in there? Um, certainly, and I would say some of them. Some of them, like one that leaps to mind, which came out of a great deal of actually scholarship, was in the Great Circulation chapter. One of the things that uh, that I found was uh, an indigenous ceviche dish, which was you know ceviche is traditionally fish that is cooked or preserved through the use of acids. But then again, we have to remember that before the Spanish came and brought out the horrors and terror that they brought to the new world. Until they came, there weren't any citrus fruits there. So instead mm -hmm. of like a modern ceviche, it would be a fish that's cooked, quote unquote, in say lime juice or juice of like sour oranges. They had a tradition of uh, preserving fish in fermented passion fruit juice. And there's also one that's uh, actually uh, preserved through something that's, uh, believe it or not, preserved through something fermented with human saliva. So that one's not in the book, but the passion fruit one is, and it's really delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so fermented passion fruit, how does it taste? Um, like pa passion fruit, but very sour. It's, you know, it's somewhere between passion fruit and like passion fruit vinegar. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fine. Fair enough. Yeah. That makes sense. And, um, 
I think yeah, with human saliva, I think I remember reading about some yep. Peruvian um, alcoholic drink um, made. So basically, we're chewing the. It could be any starchy, starchy tubers, but yeah. The, the starch, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, fantastic. <laughs> um. It's always made by women who chew it and they basically spit it into this big trough. Because uh, yeah. the, the enzymes of saliva transform uh, the starch into sugars, and then you can ferment the sugars. Yeah, correct. That's that's exactly that's exactly how it is. And um, yeah, I've seen that, and the, it sounds fine. And I would drink it if yeah. I had it. <laughs> the alcoholic drink. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. I don't know. For some people, that might sound a bit. We too, actually have Victoria and I <laughs> have an amazing chef friend who uh, made it and uh, pasteurized it afterwards, but did did make it. Mm, mm, excellent. Okay, um, that's brilliant. So, guys, which uh, of the ten dinners is uh, your favorite one? Which one um, you f- you feel more uh, like your it's your child? So let's start with uh, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's uh, very difficult to pick your favorite child, but I I would say that I feel quite attached to the Al Andalus chapter. It was actually because Jay and I wrote this book during the pandemic. Um, obviously, travel wasn't really as much of a thing, but I did have a chance to go to Granada and Cordoba. And so being able, you know, to see those cities, you know, in the Alhambra in real life was um, was really special. And I think that it's also an aspect, what I find so intriguing about it, it's an aspect of European history that one really isn't taught in Western schools, um, but two isn't even really so much a part of the kind of collective the consciousness, we don't think of an Islamic caliphate as having existed in mainland Europe during the medieval period, you know, for almost seven, seven centuries. Um, but there was an Islamic caliphate in mainland Europe, in Spain. And the it's the sort of reach um, of this culture can still be felt today. And it was, you know, this incredible society that was very religiously diverse, incredibly tolerant, just like in the Islamic world, any person of the book um, could live, you know, live freely as long as they paid the jizya tax. And so Spain was kind of this amazing Mediterranean world melting pot that also had a a huge influence from the Middle East. I mean, there were tons of ingredients that were making their way from the Middle East over to Spain, as well as things like palm trees. You know, we think of palm trees as dotting kind of Mediterranean beaches. You know, maybe they've always been there, but actually that was something that a prince who established a caliphate in Spain, Abdel Rahman, um, brought to Spain because he was incredibly homesick and he Mm. missed Damascus. And yeah, I th- I, it's just such a fascinating time period. And of course, because it was, you know, such a multicultural place, uh, the exchange of information and ideas and different kind of artistic mediums just created, I think, as um, one German nun described in the 10th century, you know, the ornament of the world. Um, Cordoba was probably the most advanced city in medieval Europe for for many, many decades, you know, with hundreds of libraries and paved streets and running water and, you know, just incredibly advanced. And and the food is absolutely fascinating as well in terms Mm. of just kind of the mixture of identities that you see in all of these recipes. Yeah, of course. We like to remind people that, Obviously, had a Jewish lot big influence from Jewish populations that they lived in uh, Spain, and obviously the um, Arabs and um, Muslims, and also Christians and local native people, and so yeah, it, it was very diverse and very there mixed. There is actually a yeah. Jewish uh, mm. dish in that in that chapter that was designed to be cooked in the embers of the fire, so you didn't have to do any work on the Sabbath. From precisely that that area in uh, <laughs> yes, Spain, yes, yes. Yeah. The Jewish uh, buried casserole, yeah. yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> genius. <laughs> totally genius. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Jay, for you, what's... Um... It's kind of a toss-up between 
the 19th century uh, New York chapter, just because the recipes are like fiendishly hard. They're so insane. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the cold dishes from that period, which were like the real, weirdly enough, these elaborate cold dishes were the real test piece of, of chef skill. But actually, I'm going to end up kind of close to Victoria here. And I'm going to say it's 10th century Baghdad. And I think the reason is, as someone who's obsessed with cookbooks and has read most of the extant historical cookbooks, at a period, I mean, actually at a period three or 400 years later in Europe, where cookbooks are still take this and this and this and cook it and serve it forth and no weights and measures, no real, you know, explanation of what you're supposed to do. Uh, occasionally you get stuff like put it back in the oven for five our fathers because, you know, everyone's Catholic. If you, if you compare <laughs> that to Baghdad in the 10th century, which was this incredibly cultured and like literate moment. In fact, there's, you know, Victoria will tell you all about the translation movement, which is like the reason we have so much of the ancient Greek stuff that comes to Europe by way of being translated into Arabic. The cookbook from that period, The Annals of the mm -hmm. Caliph's Kitchen, is this, I can only call it like a mighty tome. It's huge. It's divided into sections. <laughs> it has weights and measures. It has troubleshooting. It's like, if this doesn't work, maybe try this. And it might be because of this. It's incredibly modern. And the West doesn't catch up until maybe, you know, Renaissance Italy 500 years later. Exactly. Yeah, 500 years later. And the recipes are just incredibly sophisticated. And the book is filled with poetry and stories. And actual poetry and stories. And it's is. just incredibly <laughs> yeah. beautiful. And, and the translation is also an incredible achievement by a Noel Nasrallah, uh, who's an amazing translator. Yeah, and obviously, yeah, that's what I wanted to mention as well, that this book is translated by uh, Nasrallah. And yeah, she just yeah, also she's has amazing. her, her uh, 13th century... She really is. Uh, or her Andalusian cookbook, I think, is just out now too. So shout out to her. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, big inspiration. Uh, <laughs> amazing. Um, so, uh, for me, well, what can I say about um, for for my own um, thing? I mean, I I, I favored I think um, the Ethiopia chapter because mm. obviously I haven't um, dwelled delved into Ethiopia cuisine so much in the past. So that was kind of interesting finding all the recipes that you, all the stuff that you're talking about Ethiopia there, and. Um, I guess the Silk Road, um, again, because the recipes are a bit different. Like you have the jackfruit and mango right. with bitter melon yeah. salad or the stuffed faces with uh, walnut and so on. So all this kind of very interesting stuff. And we're talking about uh, the Silk Road. We're going from mid, uh, from like Damascus and the um, Middle East. We're going all the way to China and Mongolia, and we have all this massive, <laughs> massive continent to explore. And yeah, opens roads and mines, and you know, you think you you, you basically travel back into the past, <laughs> and you're trying to imagine all these different places. Yeah, it's amazing so, yeah. too. Because oh, I'm so happy to hear that that you enjoyed that chapter. I think something that really struck Jay and I when we started doing a Silk Road dinner with our supper club many years ago was just how interconnected the world was from, you know, such an early period. And we sort of think as, you know, our modern, global, connected world, it's, you know, this is just something that's kind of occurred in the last couple centuries. But but really, I mean, the fact that, I think we talk about this in the book, that, you know, knights in medieval England were consuming pepper from as far away as India or cloves from Indonesia. I mean, Places on, yeah. they didn't even, they couldn't even conceptualize how far away these places were. It's just totally amazing. And the fact that the foods that we eat have been coming from far away in some senses for a very long time, I think is also an interesting thread if we're looking at kind of global food history over, you know, a few thousand years. The Great Circulation, I think, is another chapter that obviously really speaks to this global movement of foods. And in case people aren't familiar with um, the original sort of 
term uh, that is used to refer to the movement of plants and animals across the globe as a consequence of European contact in for, you know, starting in 1492. Um, is Traditionally, it's referred to as the Columbian Exchange, which was a term that was coined by Alfred Crosby um, in the 70s. Um, but as Jay and I, you know, kind of sat down and, and we're putting these chapters together and really thinking about these big threads, you know, that kind of connect all of them. Um, it just didn't really sit right with us to, to kind of continue to glorify Columbus. And mm. we were looking for a term that would really uh, illustrate, you know, this, this movement, um, because it is a time period in movement, you know, potatoes and tomatoes and chocolate from the Americas were introduced to the Eurasian continent and to Africa for the first time. Um, you know, there were there were no chilies anywhere in Asia prior to 1492, which I think, you know, blows people's minds. Uh, <laughs> similarly, there were no uh, cows or horses um, or pigs in the Americas prior to European contact. Um, as well as, as Jay mentioned, uh, citrus fruit um, in the Americas either, because citrus fruit comes from the Middle East. Um, so yeah, the great circulation is just this this new term for the, the Columbian exchange. And I think that that's also a really exciting chapter to kind of sort of illuminate to, to readers the ways in which our kind of modern culinary identities are really all sort of a fusion um, of many different cuisines and many different cultures, which I think is actually, um, which is actually quite beautiful, especially, yeah. you know, given how some cuisines can be, you know, sort of nationalized in perhaps not such a kumbaya kind of way. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the great circulation is really the birth of most modern cuisines, like most cuisines that we think of as that's, that's modern yeah. cuisine. That's how, that's how that culture's food is, quote unquote. And, you know, you know, you think of Sichuan food, it's super spicy with capsicum peppers, which come from the Americas. It's, it's just that over and over again. I think it's almost impossible to find a culture whose food now that we think of as their traditional food, you know, Everywhere that has potatoes in Europe or Africa or anywhere, you know, that's all from the new. It just, it kind of blows my mind. And the other, I mean, the other really important mm. thing, I just, I just want to restate this, you know, uh, great circulation over Colombian exchange because A, Columbus genocidal psychopath and B, completely wrong. Like the reason he was going where he was going was not this nonsense yeah. as people sometimes try to say that like everyone thought the world was flat because they didn't. They actually knew it was round and how big it was. Columbus thought it was a lot smaller than that and thought he could go the other direction and it would be much shorter than it was. And if the Americas hadn't been in his way to stumble upon like a clown, there would, you know, we would never have heard of him because he would have just died in the sea. So just want to get that mm. off my <laughs> Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay, yeah, and Start the hate mail now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of the things that people think, oh, yeah, the past of people, was, uh, Earth was flat. No. Yeah, and people, and really all, you know, the entire age of exploration, quote unquote, although, you know, can, or discovery, but, you know, you can't really discover something that already exists. But, um, you know, that entire period was was motivated by finding, Europeans wanted to find a cheaper um, way to access pepper because pepper was such a huge, important ingredient in medieval European cuisine, along with a host of other spices from Asia. And they were tired of paying these exorbitant prices because of all these middlemen in between. And mm. so they were looking for India and naming the, uh, you know, people that they encountered Indians and, you know, naming the islands that they first encountered, the the West Indies, you know, and calling the, the capsicum pepper, you know, a pepper because they were sort of hoping that it wasn't maybe just a different species of pepper. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Europeans. Yeah. The real yeah. barbarians. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> 
But I mean, let's remember that pepper was the economic, you know, one of these major economic engines of the world. And, you know, so many things were invented to serve exactly what she's talking about. Everything from corporations and commercial insurance and joint stock companies and na major parts of navigation, you know, and that at any given time, like those boats that were doing this were throughout much of history, the most sophisticated human product in the world was the ocean going vessel. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and all yeah. for spices, and specifically pepper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, like a food trend sort of drove the events that would change the course of human history, which really is mind-boggling and quite a lot to wrap your head around. Most definitely. Great. I'll be back after this short break. I want to ask you a question about... So, chapter one is about ancient Rome, which... Um, we have a lot of information from and a lot of texts and the first kind of cookbook in the uh, Western world, let's say, per se, which is Apicius or Apicius um, recipes. The first thing you have is the, the conditum paradoxum, if I'm not mistaken, right? The, which you call fine spiced wine, pearled. That's something that when I saw it, it was, ding, what's that? <laughs> what's going on? Do you, you would like to explain <laughs> something about that pearled element? Well, I mean, the pearled, the pearled wine references a, a possibly a, a apocryphal story um, where uh, Cleopatra and M Mark Anthony basically bet each other that each one could have a more expensive feast than the other one. And Mark Anthony went first thing with this very elaborate feast, and then Cleopatra had her very elaborate feast, and it was non obvious which was the more expensive and elaborate. And at the end, she took a goblet. Um, of vinegar and wine in which a pearl, a very large and incredibly expensive pearl, had been dissolved and she drank it, thereby winning the bet. Um, but also the, the, the fine spiced wine was a traditional way to begin, you know, a Roman meal. So I thought it was like very apropos that we began the book with it as well. But had a good story. I think that's edible history right there. It's it's correct, but it has a beautiful, possibly apocryphal story in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And um, yeah, talking about that drink and um, the the conditum paradox and the spiced wine. So we see through history, we see versions of it coming up again and again, like in Tudor England and in France mm. and so on, and all this great like all the um, higher classes and kings and emperors, they used to drink something similar, right? Absolutely. I mean, that one comes up over and over again. I think like Victoria might do a better job of explaining the, like, the place, especially that Europeans held spice and this kind of the magical ideas that, that surrounded, which is why you tend to see these spiced, you know, medicinal, quote unquote, like humoral medicine. Spiced wines. wines. Like, throughout history? Yeah. Mm, yeah, if you want, Victoria, to give us a yeah. few more words about it. Well, spices um, from the East, and, and when we say spices, we we're, we're, we talk about um, you know, black pepper, ginger, cloves, cinnamon, nutmeg, um, you know, that are all quite kind of common pantry staples today. You know, these are spices that you can buy at the supermarket for not, you know, huge sums of money if you're just sort of buying sort of standard generic types. But in medieval Europe, because they were coming from so far away, uh, they were incredibly expensive. And because they were incredibly expensive, they became this sort of status symbol. It was like having a designer handbag or, you know, a luxury car. It was a way to kind of demonstrate your wealth. So um, the elite medieval Europeans um, loved using these Eastern spices um, in dishes, but also, you know, spicing their wines with it. They believed that these spices had all sorts of medicinal properties, you know, some of which they weren't completely wrong about. Um, but there, there was sort of a conception that these spices would help to open up one's stomach at the beginning of a large feast, kind of prepare the <laughs> stomach to receive all the delicious, um, you know, plates of food it was about to receive. Um, so it was sort of like an appropriate way to, to start a meal. Um, but it was pretty incredible, the sort of 
zeitgeist that surrounded spices from the East um, in, in Europe for hundreds of years, it culminating as, as we were just chatting about with, um, you know, ultimately, you know, the events of 1492 and, mm. um, and you know, what, what, what we refer to as the Great Circulation. Um, but yeah, spices really had a, had a hold on those medieval Europeans. They were, they were hooked. Let me add one funny spice to the myth while we're at it, though. Because as, as Victoria's saying, you know, this is an era of, of humoral medicine where people believe that all your all your health was based on your, your four humors, you know, like blood and black bile and white bile and, you know, and everything was hot or cold or and you could tell a person's balance of humors by their disposition. And that's why we have words like choleric, because like that person had too much color, you know. Um, and that's too much heat and that's too much this. And you could balance these if you could possibly afford it by using these spices. But the one they forget is sugar. And it's important to remember that sugar in that period mm. really was considered a spice. It was, it came from incredibly far away. And the history of sugar is incredibly interesting because if you look at uh, India where sugar is indigenous, you can go today and get Indian sweets made with jaggery or like unrefined sugar that have barely changed for like 2000 years. And they're often very tricky to make for certain reasons, which is kind of the beauty of them, but they are just the same thing that someone was eating 2000 years mm. ago. But it wasn't until that sugar reached the Middle East who had, you know, a scientific tradition and had developed distillation, which is how they were making, for example, rose water, that they could refine this raw sugar into this fine white sugar. And by the time this fine white magical sugar reached all the way to Europe, it was incredibly expensive. And what strikes me as very funny, in today's world where people, you know, think of fine white sugar as like, the devil in you know food form and it's bad for you and it's you know bad in every way at that period it was thought of as one of the few things that was like universally healthy and good for everyone if you could afford it which you couldn't mm. <laughs> it's just amazing honestly the way the way we think of certain foods you know then versus now but but also just how you know, the, the way a society or a culture, you know, considers an ingredient completely determines, you know, the consumption pattern around it um, and mm -hmm. how much that has changed over years. I think, you know, the narrative that is attached to dishes or ingredients is is vital in its consumption and, and how it will be treated yeah. or consumed. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Um, so continuing our adventure in the book, um, um, mm -hmm. my, my other note was, um, so yeah, the, the chapter two, Baghdad, the very complex and delightful and detailed book of Al-Warak. There is uh, the recipe for uh, fish, <laughs> so stuffed whole that fish amazing. cooked three That's ways. That's a mind blower. Mm. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> um, that, I mean, that one I just had to do because it's such, you know, it's such a crazy, sophisticated one. And it's also, you know, using a a, uh, a tenor oven, which is which is in the ground. It's not uh, front facing the way uh, Western style ovens are. It's the same kind of oven you still see in India and in the Middle East, a lot of places. But the idea was, and there's basically two versions. You could just do this with a fish and you, you know, you spice it and you herb it and, you know, and then you wrap the center section of the fish. Originally it was cloth that was soaked in oil, but with many, many turns wraps around the center part. And then you place <laughs> a very thin piece of cloth really soaked in oil just over the tail. And you put the whole thing in a very hot oven, probably hung with the tail at the hottest part, but set up in such a way that the head then roasts and the middle part poaches as if it was cooked in water and the tail part fries and i actually mm. uh added a trick taken from uh chinese cooking where you finish the tail also with a pour of of extremely hot oil to accentuate the frying and then 
if you manage to do all that, there is a stuffed version. And stuffed historically often doesn't mean what we what we think it means today, whereas often you say stuffed and you're taking a whole fish and you're putting something inside it, which is actually the way to say like the 13th century uh, stuffed fish and walnut that you mentioned has. But this many times, like the stuffed leg of lamb mm. in uh, the Renaissance Italian, you're taking all the flesh off a thing, grind it up, and really making a force meat out of it that's heavily spiced and flavored. Um, and then with the fish, it's reconstituted into the the shape of the fish and the skin, which you've carefully removed, is put back on. Which is actually, this is actually very similar to a traditional way of making gefilte fish, although then it would be boiled as opposed to, you know, roasted, poached, and fried simultaneously in this case. It's just a crazy recipe. Yeah, it's just uh, one of these recipes that is about showing off, basically. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other way you can explain it. <laughs> Why would you do that? Totally. <laughs> My next question would like to be, which is, um, which was um, the most difficult thing to do? What recipes to recreate? The most, te- yeah, the most technically difficult? Technically, but also... Uh, like, I'm gonna go. I'm actually gonna gonna go with 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 technically on this one, uh, let's only see. because it, it's it's a late recipe. It is one that has a very very accurate recipe, which is the ballotine of squab a la Madison in uh, the 19th century New York chapter, which is from uh, Ranhofer's uh, 1894 book, The Epicurean, which is the biggest, most beautiful cookbook probably ever made it's 2000 pages it's incredibly illustrated it's just crazy so what Gee. you do is you uh you bun a squab which is a pigeon and you fill it with a truffled uh force meat around ham and uh foie gras and you cook it off in a mold and then you cool it remember how i said that you know elaborate cold dishes were like the acne in this period you cook it mm. and you chill it and you take it out of the mold. Now you have this little semicircular thing. And then you uh, fill the mold with chauffois sauce, which is a, a white stabilized sauce. And you put it back in the mold and you chill it and you take it out of the mold. And then you put in the mold an elaborately cut truffle, which sits on top of this. And uh, you fill the mold with aspic, which is sort of a wine jelly. And you chill it. And you take it out of the mold, and now you have this thing that looks like a French bomb, like a beautiful French confectionery. And theoretically, you make 12 of them. And then, and this is where I say, I have actually never made this full recipe. Because then you carve this stand with these arms, and each one holds one of these. And then you take fat or wax, or a combination of fat and wax, and you carve griffins holding seashells, and you put the stand on top of the griffins holding the seashells, and then you <laughs> you garnish it with whole truffles and coxcombs and elaborately cut other pieces of aspic, and it goes on for another page just describing the garnish. And I have never managed to do all that, but I hope to someday. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exhausted just listening. <laughs> uh, Victoria, on your on your side, like not technically difficult dish, but some uh, like a recipe that would be that you struggled perhaps to include in the book, or you didn't include at the end, or you included but you thought you thought about it a lot. Is there something actually there? I think actually, um, maybe not in terms of recipes, but I think some of the history that I had a hard time writing, um, strangely, were sort of the periods of history that are most kind of well known. Um, mm. You know, in many chapters, I sort of I try and choose um, an actual person from that time period to kind of follow through the chapter, you know, and then it adds this whole other dimension to Jay's recipes because you can kind of start to picture the humans who, you know, were consuming these dishes. But I found Versailles quite challenging and also Renaissance Italy. And I was happy to sort of I guess, uh, become m- more deeply acquainted with some 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 characters like um, Lucrezia Borgia and um, as well as Louis XIV's 
brother, um, Philippe, who was quite a character. And um, it took a while to get there, but eventually it was it was good to find some people who aren't as well known from those time periods and then be able to illuminate the, the history. I'm just going to chime in and say, I love uh, Victoria's uh, mm. Renaissance yeah, yeah. chapter, particularly like Lucretia Borgia stuff, who is not the person you thought she is. <laughs> and it's it's a brilliant bit of history. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Uh, with the Pope and um, the murders and the, the hunt and all the stuff. Yeah, I, I love that chapter as well. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> and the recipes in the chapter that I mean they to me as Greek and Mediterranean and okay a cook as well uh, they seem quite not modern but quite familiar you know what I mean ravioli we have ravioli mm. we have uh, tuna steaks we have uh, stuffed leg of lamb which is more elaborate dish as you said it's all cut and then reconstituted around the, the bone <laughs> but yeah they they, they, they sound quite. Yeah, I feel like that, that is familiar in, in, in many more, ways. You know, I actually yeah. tried to show a through line, which is something that Victoria and I do a lot. Where we're trying to show the connections between different periods and the connections between earlier historic pe- periods and today. So that one I wanted to show, like the same way the Ethiopian chapter is like mm, the birth of yeah. modern Ethiopian cuisine and how it you know came together to United Kingdom. This is you know this is. A lot of the things are mm. going to become familiar dishes and have hints of that. So that's where we're trying to go. Yeah. Oh my God! Now you just said about Ethiopia, <laughs> the, the crazy lamb, lamb leg. <laughs> oh, isn't that amazing? Oh, the, the whip cut lamb leg. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who thought of that? <laughs> Someone cool and smart. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Mental. Um, let's leave it there as a surprise for people to get the yeah. book and see it with their own eyes. <laughs> Marvelous. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's crazy. I want to go a bit more in the New York chapter because obviously it's the new world. It's Americans. It, it's uh, quite recent. And for me, it was new. It was kind of mm. um, uh, as part of um, my research was not something that I investigated in the past, you know. And, um, yeah, do you want to talk to me about about that a little bit? Well, Jay can definitely uh, illuminate the recipes a bit better. But I th- it's an interesting period, um, I mean, f- for food history and for food in America, but also um, for New York City's history. You know, the 19th century mm. was this period of massive change because in 1800, New York City was just a tiny little trading town nestled on the very bottom of, you know, the island of Manhattan. And then by the end of the century, which is not a long you know, amount of time, it was this huge booming metropolis with people, you know, pouring in from every corner of the earth um, and, and big buildings and the entire island had, you know, had been expanded upon and was inhabited as well as Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island. And the Bronx. So it felt like a really great sort of moment to choose in American history um, because there was so much change. And then also the expansion of the city inherently affected what people ate. Um, You know, at the beginning of the 19th century, people really just ate at home. Uh, Obviously, if you were traveling, you might eat it in in a tavern or something. But by the end of the century, we see this institution, the restaurant, has appeared. And the restaurant was first, or the concept of the restaurant uh, was first introduced to America uh, actually by French chefs who were fleeing France um, during and after the French Revolution, um, usually mm. kind of elite chefs whose uh, former employers perhaps uh, had lost a head. We're, we're no longer we're no longer kicking, um, and so they brought this concept of the restaurant uh, Restauré. It's actually a space uh, in Paris where you could get this restorative broth, and then slowly mm. uh, it kind of evolved into what we now think of the restaurant, where you can enter this space. There is a menu. There are items that you can, you know, choose from what you want to eat. And with the introduction of the restaurant comes, you know, new ways of dining and, you know, incredibly elaborate dishes like the ballotines of swab that Jay was um, just describing. But 
I think probably Jay, I don't know, maybe Rand Hoffer is, is also kind of an amazing yeah, definitely. outcome I think, of I think the birth the, of the restaurant in New York. The recipes in that chapter are actually a perfect example of, of what we're talking about, how the recipes serve the story we're trying to tell. Because they're basically two, two sets of them. The earlier ones, which come primarily from uh, Hand Glass's 1775 cookbook, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Simple, and... Uh, Maria Rundell's 1806 cookbook. There's a lot of crossover between those cookbooks. There's a lot of recipes that are actually in both. And the recipe to me exemplifies the early part of that period where you had like a growing middle class. And you were changing from a, a position of like just food being, you know, for the for the very rich or elaborate food. Um, there's a recipe for mock turtle soup. And those of you who remember Alice in Wonderland may remember the character of the mock turtle, which is an enormous sea turtle with a calf's head, which is a joke that, you know, 19th century is what people, whether they were in England or America, would, would have got very easily. And at the time, turtle soup was a real status dish. And the most valuable part or the most delicious quote unquote part was the green and kind of unctuous fat around the collar of a giant ocean sea turtle. This was also a period where you had a rising middle class and you had people who were like aspirational in their food choices. So they wanted to eat this turtle soup, but they couldn't afford it. So they come up with a really clever workaround. What they would do is they would make a rich savory broth and they would get a calf's head, which is relatively cheap, and you just boil it and boil it and boil it and boil it and boil it until it, it turns into mm. a gushy, gooey monstrosity we would think of today, but very similar to the very greasy, fatty, soft, gelatinous collar of the sea turtle. And they would use that in place of it. Hmm. And it's actually delicious and I've served it many times. So the first half of the chapter is, is pub food and smaller food and the growth of the restaurant. And yet then it ends up with these incredibly elaborate, you know, Delmonico's dishes was the most important restaurant in New York and probably in America at the time. And at one point there were seven of them. Um, and it ends mm. with elaborate desserts and the Alaska, Florida, which is the birth of the based Alaska, which is directly from that period. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about the turtle soup. So the reason that the turtle soup was more of elite food, was it because in the beginning there were abundant the amount of turtles, but they they were eaten almost to an extinction. Yeah, there was they're they're endangered now, so don't eat them. Yeah. Um, also, there weren't that you know they, they were becoming rare and error, but they're also not they're not a simple fish to catch. You're not, it's not like cod where you're just going out with a boat and throwing a giant net and dragging tons and tons of fish out. You're still you know you have to catch them. Um, mm. There aren't a lot of them. In fact, they were so prized that when one was caught, either the tavern that had the food mm. or the butcher shop that had the meat would hang the fresh turtle shell outside their establishment so people could see that they really had turtle meat and that it was relatively fresh. Mm -hmm. And similar with the oysters, I believe yeah. um, one of the opening stuff on the on the chapter is about the <laughs> incalculable amount of oysters and oyster beds in um, Bronx and um, in, in New York around the, 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 the rivers and the oceans around there, right? Yeah, it was incredible. Uh, New York's harbor once contained over half of the world's oyster population. In fact, today, because obviously they were um, they were overfished uh, to the point of, of, of nearly being extinct, and also the waterways around New York became incredibly polluted. Um, but today, actually, to kind of help strengthen the seashores against hurricanes and, and flooding mm -hmm. that's occurring more regularly in the five boroughs, there's this huge initiative to replant all of the oyster beds. So they actually, there used to be sort of like a natural storm barrier. But because yeah. oysters were so abundant, they were one of the staple foods of the Lenepe, who were the indigenous people who lived in the land we now call New York um, prior to, to the Europeans arriving. Um, and then even when the Europeans arrived, oysters remained one of the staple food well into the 19th century. And oysters you know, were, were consumed by all classes. Um, I don't know if it could be sort of the equivalent of a, a slice of pizza to New Yorkers today. You know, you could eat it 
some, you know, kind of fancy coal oven pizza, you know, oysters in a very refined environment. Um, but there were also street carts outside of factories that sold, you know, a dozen oysters for a couple pennies to, to factory workers on their lunch break. So it was really kind of the universal um, food of New Yorkers for most of the city's history, actually, which is really interesting. Mm, great. Do you want to say something, uh, Jay? I think, I think, um, Victoria did oysters pretty darn well. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> I think we could wrap it up now. We gave a sure. lot of uh, tantalizing stuff to <laughs> <laughs> for people to get hooked and get the book. Would you like to tell us some um, again, like when the book is out and what? Or, or, or... Um, yeah, if you like to find more information about um, about us, about Edible History and the book, you can visit our website, ediblehistorynyc.com or follow us on Instagram at Edible History and our book, A History of the World in 10 Dinners, uh, comes out September 19th with Rizzoli and is available, I believe, in the UK only through Amazon at the moment. Um, so if you want to pre-order a copy, that would be where to go. But also go to your local friendly bookstore and implore them to, to, to carry some copies. <laughs> yes, we should do that because it's an amazing book. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank really you so great. much. We're so thrilled that you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really lovely chatting with you. It was great talking to you. Lovely, lovely. And um, I hope um, <laughs> one day we can do something all together. <laughs> Either London or New York. You're very welcome. Yes. Yes, we need to do it. We need to do a historical supper club marvelous. together. Yeah. That would be pretty epic. Exactly. Fantastic. Lovely. Victoria, Jay, thank you for coming to the Delicious Legacy. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Fantastic. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. You as well. Bye. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the tantalizing fragments of historical facts in Victoria's and Jay's book. And remember, the book is released on 19th of September in US, and Amazon is shipping it internationally for pre-orders. I've been your archaeogastro sailor, Tom Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. If you want the podcast early and ad-free, please join me on Patreon, where you can also find exclusive episodes and unique recipes from $3 per month. This podcast can only happen with your general support. If you have any ideas or any other suggestions and you want to get in touch with me, please feel free to email me at thedeliciouslegacypodcast at gmail.com All one word. thedeliciouslegacypodcast at gmail.com Till the next time, thank you and goodbye.